All right. First Corinthians chapter one is. Uh, it was good to be on vacation last week. I'm glad that John filled in. That didn't get recorded, I, I don't think. So that's why it's not on the internet. And then Dr. Bob Mounts preaching on Sunday morning, and I had the privilege. April, April and I uh, later Sunday were able to watch the video of that, and uh, he is. Uh, well, he's a good preacher, and he's he's a lot of fun too. Met with him yesterday. We have a pastors group that we meet together, and uh, but I told him I said the church really uh, appreciates your preaching. Uh, Bob is eighty seven, and uh, and I told you all that uh, he had lost his wife of seventy one years. Well, technically they dated for four years, and they were married for sixty seven, but don't sue me, okay? Uh, but Bob is eighty seven and still has the he studies and has the desire to. Uh, edify the body of Christ through the teaching and preaching of his word. So I'm thankful for his friendship. Now, we come back to our studying this in this fall semester at Covington Theological Seminary on Monday nights. And it has been a benefit to me to be able to take those studies and then apply them here. So that's what I'm doing. Tonight we're going to cover chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. Let me remind you of where we've been. In the first nine verses, Paul introduces the letter and then gives thanks to God for the Corinthian believers. Now, most of this letter, and I will say that, most of this letter is corrective. Yet he sees them as the people of God. Correcting brothers and sisters in the body of Christ is not easy to do, and I think many churches just ignore it because, well, if we do that, they will leave. Well, then the church they go to should send them back. <laughs> uh, we, we've gotten into this habit, especially as Southern Baptist, of like, oh, I'm glad they're leaving. Yeah, give them a letter of good standing. Why would you do that? They're, they're not in good standing. Well, they're not our problem. Oh, so it's okay if, if we send them to some other church? Yeah. No. Paul, in part, is teaching us the necessity of correction in the body. When we get to chapter 5, it's the most severe form where Paul says of the immoral man in the congregation, he goes, I've, he's excommunicated. I have judged him. He's out. Now, if he'll repent, we'll bring him back in. And people say, is that the loving thing to do? Yes. It's just like your children. If you do not discipline your children, you are raising future monsters. Well, they're already monsters, but their full potential until later. Talk to a teacher in the public classroom. It is vastly different today than it was 30 years ago. Correction is necessary. Why? Because sinners are going to sin, even redeemed ones. And if you belong to the Lord, Hebrews says he chastens those whom he loves. So if you say, well, God never chastens me, never corrects me, well, what does that mean? Either you're lying or you don't know him and he doesn't know you. Why, why did I just go on that little tangent? Because most of the letter is corrective, and yet he loves these people and sees them as his brothers and sisters in Christ. He doesn't have an agenda against them. He wants to see them come to maturity in Christ, and he knows how difficult that process is. It's like taking a baby from infancy to the terrible twos, that's what they're called, and what are you constantly having to do? Now, if you only correct them and never give them encouragement, that's out of balance as well. But you're correcting, you're showing the boundaries. Oh, we don't do that with our children. We only affirm them. Well, okay, get ready for visiting him in jail, I guess. I, I, mean, I don't know what else to tell you. Loving someone will include correcting them. We've bought into this idea, even in the church, that to love them means don't correct them, only affirm them. That, that's worldly counsel. In chapter 1, verses 10 through 17, now, starting in verse 10 of chapter 1 and going all the way through the end of chapter 6 is the first of two sections in the letter, and it's dealing with division in the body. Division. 
The particular division in verses 10 through 17 was about personal favoritism regarding ministers. I'm of Paul. Oh, well, I'm of Apollos. <laughs> I'm of Cephas. Well, we've got you all beat. I'm of Christ. And Paul says, why are you doing that? Some might argue, but Daryl, there are certain pastors that you have mentioned that have, you know, notoriety uh, on, a, on a much larger stage. Yes, I appreciate them. I love them. They're not beyond falling. And they're certainly never to be worshipped. Paul would not be arguing about you can only like Apollos' teaching. He would say, no, appreciate that God has saved Apollos and is preaching the word, but appreciate that Cephas, God has saved and is preaching the word. Be on guard against this personal favoritism because what it's done now is like, I've got my little Paul group, my little Apollos group, my little Cephas group, and my little Christ group. And lest you think, well, the Christ group is the good one. No, they're just as bad. Why? In fact, they're probably worse because they're not really acting like they're in Christ's group because pride has taken over. And two weeks ago, we looked at verses 18 to 25 on the preaching of the cross and true wisdom. He's going to continue that theme a little bit on wisdom. But let's look at the calling of the Corinthians. These were Gentiles who grew up in a society, a culture, that not only permitted sexual immorality, but promoted it. Imagine meeting a person born in Las Vegas, <laughs> grew up in Las Vegas, still lives in Las Vegas. Do you think they might have had some influence in their life that would not be befitting of Christ? Yes. Yet, if God saves them, they are called out of that life and to a life of holy living. Do you think that is just automatic and easy? No. That's what Paul is dealing with here. He's having to remind them of some things. So their sexual promiscuity is, is the norm. Ego is a big thing. Rhetoric. Oh, what a great speaker. Oh, I want to be him. I, I want to be like that guy. All of that stuff they already had within them. The problem is, is that they're returning to it now where Christ has made them his own, they're actually returning to some of their old habits. And that's where Paul is having to, to correct. Let me just read the verses. Verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'll read through the end of the chapter. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. That doesn't sound very nice. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Verse 31, so that it is, or so that as it is written, this comes from Jeremiah 9, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So verse 26, the calling here is referring to God saving these people. It is not referring to a vocational calling. I believe that God has called me to the pastoral ministry. That's not where Paul is going here. He's talking about you were lost and God saved you. That's the calling. God called you to salvation. Hallelujah. Let me tell you why he didn't call you. And this is where it's going to sting. He didn't call you because of your great wisdom. You didn't have it. What a mean thing. True. And if you weren't acting so proud, I wouldn't have to say this. If you weren't so puffed up with your so-called wisdom, I wouldn't have to say what I just said. God didn't... You're, you're acting as if, boy, when God found us, He hit the jackpot, didn't He? Where would He be without us? 
And Paul is writing from a distance away going, I know I didn't teach you that. How did that creep in in 18 months? Well, it doesn't take long. Remember, Paul had lived there for 18 months. He's been gone for about 18 months. The church is about three years old, maybe four, nonetheless still very young in its infancy. And it didn't take long for Paul to leave and all of this garbage to begin to grow. He didn't call you to salvation because of your great wisdom or your power or your nobility. This is not Paul being mean, but he is chopping them down a little bit here. He is, and rightly so. That's how the world chooses people. Why are you in this club? Because the president and the vice president and the secretary in this little club looked at you and said, hey, his dad's got a lot of money. That might speak well for our club. Let's get him. Or things like that. Paul says, God didn't choose you because of those things. He chose you because he chose you. He saved you. Think about the calling of the twelve. When Jesus selected those apostles, none of them made the rabbinical cut. When you're a Jewish boy, you have your bar mitzvah, but they're 13 years of age. If you don't make the cut to go on to greater theological studies, you go into the family business. You're a man. What did Peter and Andrew and James and John do? What was their living? Do you remember? Fishermen. Fishermen. Why? Because that's what their dads did. I wonder what their granddads did. Probably fishermen. Now Matthew would have been the renegade because he went into being a tax collector. That would have been a shame to his family. But in other words, the men that Jesus picked to be the apostles, no rabbi would have ever picked them. They were not, not only were they not the cream of the crop, they weren't in the crop. And I've used this before, but I think it's worthwhile to use again. He picks Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. Zealots lived to kill tax collectors. Matthew knew that Simon was in the bunch and Simon knew that Matthew was in the bunch. Do you think that Matthew didn't go to bed last at times with one eye open? Where is he? Which ought to be music to your ears. God doesn't need me to be of noble birth because really man determines that. God doesn't need me to be the valedictorian of my school. He doesn't. Not that he can't use valedictorians or the cream of the crop, because he does. But we get this idea that we have to be someone for God to save us and use us. Friend, he can use whoever he wants to use. And that knocks you down from that high horse, that pedestal you have built for yourself, thinking that, well, God has called me because. Stop right there. And get on your knees and thank God for calling you and leave the reasoning up to him. Verse 27, God of his own choosing chose what fallen man considers as foolish so as to shame the wise. He chose the weak so as to shame the supposed strong. His ways are not our ways. They're not. Lord, how do you propose we get uh, across the Red Sea? I propose I part the waters and you walk across on dry land. Yeah, I don't see that happening. Watch me. Lord, how do you propose we uh, bring the walls of Jericho down? I propose that you do exactly what I say. One time a day, for six days, you walk around it. Don't say anything. But on the seventh day, you're going to go around seven times. On that last time, you're going to blow your trumpets when I tell you to. And then I'm going to bring them down. 
Well, that's a very odd strategy, Lord. It's not strategy, it's my ways, and they're not your ways. God, how are we ever gonna grow grace fellowship? I think I have that covered, Daryl. Now, he uses the means of inviting people, evangelism. Yeah, he does do that. We're not in a competition with anyone. We're also living in a time where more and more people are seeing less of a need to be a part of a church. And that didn't take him by surprise either. Well, God, if I were you, I were going to do... Let's just stop right there. You're not me. Case closed. Dismissed. You may go. <laughs> I choose the foolish things to shame the supposed wise of the world because they're not really wise. I choose the weak things to show that the supposed strong aren't strong at all. I do what I do the way I do it because that's who I am. And if I want to march you around a city made of rock and it's a solid fortress and bring it down on my call, I'll do it. If I want to give you rivers in the middle of a desert, I'll do it. And I don't need you to come up with some engineering marvel. I simply will do it. Someone asked me one time, and, and it's not a bad question, how is God going to raise those who, maybe they got eaten by a shark 1,500 years ago. Maybe they died in a plane crash where there wasn't much to find. How's he going to do that? I went, well, let's see. He created out of nothing. I think he's got it. He said he would. I can't figure that out. Well, here's the good news. You're not him and neither am I, but he is and he said he would do it. His ways are not our ways, folks. His, his, th his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Verse 28, God shows what man considers as low and despised to nullify the so-called elite status of some. Why should we let you into our super spiritual Jesus club? What can you bring to the table? Let's see, I'm a sinner. I've got that going for me. Um... I tend to blow it a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm a lot more self-centered than I want to admit, but I don't want to be. When are we going to get to the good stuff? Well, there really isn't much good stuff to get to. I'm, I'm just telling you that uh, I don't know if I qualify for your super spiritual Jesus club or not, but he saved me. Do you have any preaching awards? Not that I know of. Maybe mama gave me one that I never got from her, but not that I know of. Well, have you built congregations from the ground up to 10,000 members? Nope. Have you written books? Nope. Well, I wrote a dissertation, which technically is published, but no, not really. <laughs> well, then what can you offer? I got a heart for Jesus. I'm not the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And I'm not being asked to come and give lectures or TED Talks to the elite minds of our day. Elon Musk hasn't reached out to me to help with the SpaceX program, and I doubt he ever would. I don't have much going for me. I mean, again, Christ has saved me. And I can learn, and, and I'm willing to follow him wherever he leads. And that's really what it came down to with Jesus. Jesus. Follow me. Well, Lord, as soon as... No, no, you're not worthy. Uh, you follow me. Well, Lord, here's what I've got to do. And then, no, you're not worthy of the kingdom. Because something or someone will always be more of a priority. Follow me, Peter. Yes, Lord, wherever you go. Watch me use that. That's what he does. <laughs> and Paul is telling these believers who are entrenched in a culture that, that just prides itself on be someone, be someone, be someone. Be the top of the class. Be the guy who's making seven figures instead of just six. Be the guy who builds the bigger house in the better neighborhood and drives the finer car. Be all of that. Why? I'm not telling you you'll be lazy and homeless, but why are those your ambitions when you can be an ambitious person and do very well, but let me ask you, is this your ultimate ambition? To know Christ and to follow him. Corinthian brothers and sisters, you need to come back to that very simple reality. God has saved you. By the time we get to the end of the chapter, he's going to really nail down his argument. 
But in verse 29, Paul says that the reason why God does these things is to show that no person can rightly boast in himself before God. Stephen, why are you said, well, Daryl, let me tell you, buddy, I was lost and dying in my sin, but I pulled myself up and I've memorized three Old Testament books of the Bible. That had to be the reason. No? No. Vaughn, what was it for you? Oh, let me tell you. I was a nobody, but I have built myself, and now I'm a somebody, and God saw that potential. No. No. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I'm going to use an Old Testament example that I think it'll make sense. I hope it does. It just came to my mind. It's not in my notes. Do you remember Mephibosheth? One of Saul's sons. Excuse me, Jonathan's son. I'm sorry, not Saul. Jonathan, uh, Saul's grandson. I think he was five years old. He was dropped, so he was lame in his feet. Remember that now? Saul died David didn't want Saul to die, but David does become king. And he says, is there anyone from Saul's lineage that I can show mercy to? And they said, well, there's, there's a Mephibosheth. He goes, bring him to me. And Mephibosheth is brought before the king. Now he's royalty because his papa, his granddad was Saul and his father, Jonathan. And David says, here's what I'm going to do for you, son. You're going you're gonna to live in my house. You're going to eat at my table all the days of your life. Mephibosheth said, who am I? He didn't say, that's right. Because my granddad was king before you. He doesn't do any of that. King, why would you regard a dog? King, why are you showing me mercy? I don't, I'm not deserving of this. It's a beautiful picture, folks. It's, a, it's an awesome story. And Mephibosheth got it in the presence of David, a fellow sinner. How much more a believer in the presence of holy God. God, why would you show mercy to me? Because I chose to. It is enough, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you all were able to see this. This was, I think, well over a year ago now. Yeah, it was it maybe much further back than I'm thinking, but Alistair Begg was preaching at a church and he was talking about uh, Jesus and the two men that he hung in between and the one man who came to finally see who Jesus was and Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And he said, play along with me in a bit of foolishness. So he does set it up that way. But he goes, could you imagine if that man was at heaven's gates? And no, we don't think this is actually how it happens. But again, just play along that if he was at heaven's gates and the angels were there going, okay, now who are you? And uh, okay, now, now why are you here? What would that man's response be? It would probably be this. Because the man on the middle cross said that I could come. That's all I've got. The man on the middle cross said that I could come. Folks, it's not different for you or me. Well, Daryl, he knew that you were going to go to college and then seminary. No. Well, he did know those things. That's not why he saved. Well, he saw potential in you. No, that's not why he saved me. He saved me. Period. Thanks be to God. Now, I want to do things for the Lord, and I want to grow, and I want to serve, but he saved me because he saved me. And I don't ever want to forget that. And I hope you don't ever forget that he saved you. And just bask in him. Quit trying to figure out, now, why would he save me? What was it he saw in me? God, thank you for being merciful to me, the sinner. God does what he does to take the, the sinner whom he saves and he strips them of any personal, well, here's why you did it. Stop. 
I saved you. Quit beaming and boasting in yourself. Verse 30, it is because of God that any sinner is accepted by Christ Jesus. Jesus is true wisdom personified. He has saved a people for himself. He imputes his righteousness to those whom he saves. He sanctifies those whom he saves. He redeems those whom he saves. Who's Paul putting the emphasis on? I'll give you a hint. Not the Corinthians. Jesus. And then in verse 31, he quotes from Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Now remember, Jeremiah is a contemporary of Habakkuk. I mean, they're all right there. Daniel, Ezekiel, they're all in that general time period where the southern kingdom is falling to the Babylonians or the Chaldeans, which are southern Babylonians, and they're taken into captivity. And um, Jeremiah preached for over five decades and had very few converts, but he proved himself faithful. And much of what he writes is solemn and hard. He says in Jeremiah 9, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Well, if I boast in the Lord, how am I going to boast in me? Exactly my point. Let me just paint this picture for you folks. If we have a church with few or with many or somewhere in between, I don't know how we use the metrics to, de to define that, but a church full of itself and proud, we could be very small, very large, or very in between, and it wouldn't take long for people who actually know and love Jesus to come in and realize something. Well, they, they put all the bells and whistles in place, but Jesus is not the main attraction. Have you heard what we're doing in Hickson, Tennessee? Have you seen the great things that Grace Fellowship has done? Oh, look at how much money we've raised and sent. Look at how many missionaries we've sent out. Look at how many kids are getting saved in our VBS. Look at us. Yeah, that's the problem. You want us to look at you and all of your great accomplishments. When the Bible consistently says in Old and New Testament, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We're not talking about this spiritual uh, phonyism of, oh, it's all Jesus, and then you really act like it's not. Grace Fellowship. What, what did you all do to see this or this or this? Happen? You know, the Lord led us in his word and he, he brought some opportunities before us and we followed him and man, we, we just saw God do a great work. What'd you do? Well, we followed. <laughs> well, give us a manual. How do, we, how do we put that in other churches? No, 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 it's not a formula. That's another thing, and I sound like I'm just bashing the SBC, but I'm so sick of our you know, new programs that are really just old, old programs rehashed and retitled. How'd that church get a 32% increase in attendance? I don't know, maybe they started offering free alcohol. I don't know. May what we do in this church and may what other churches who are like-minded, may our intention and our heartbeat be to know and to follow Jesus and to see him do great work and to make much of him rather than ourselves. Folks, I'm just going to say it like this. The day is very likely going to come when Grace Fellowship of North Hamilton County will cease to exist. I grew up at Oak Street Baptist Church in Saudi Daisy, and it's been there a long time. The day will probably come when that will cease to exist as a church. Am I trying to discourage you? No. Why am I being such a bummer? The churches that Jesus preached to in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the church at Ephesus, starts there. You've got Ephesus here, gateway to Asia, and you end up in Laodicea. And all of the churches are in a geographical pattern. What are you all hearing out of the church of Ephesus today? Anybody seeing any great sermons out of the church of Ephesus on, on the internet? How about the church of Laodicea? How are they doing today? You have nothing? You know why? 
They don't exist today. But the church does. So I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer. I'm simply trying to communicate what is important is not that people in Hickson and Soggy Daisy or Chattanooga even, it's not important that they know who Grace Fellowship is. It's important that they know who Jesus Christ is. And if Grace Fellowship is a means to make him known and to minister, hallelujah. But it will always be Jesus that they need to know. Always. And I think one of the problems that we see in churches is that we become more enamored with our name and our, quote, successes, that it's, it's really more about us. I'll give you one example, and then I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I, uh, I knew of a situation where church discipline needed to be enacted. I knew this because I was told this by a pastor seeking counsel. But the rebuttal and the pushback was from a family member of the person who was going to be disciplined. And the family member was like, what will this do to our family? Better question. What is going to do to the name of Christ? You are more worried about your family's reputation in small town America in the glorious name of the God who saved us? Well, yeah, because if we do this, then we're not going to be the church that people want to go to. And we're not going to be the happening church anymore. I can already tell you, you're not already, and you just don't know it. When your boast is in Christ, you are willing to do whatever He says. You go wherever He leads. When you're more enamored with yourself, you begin to dictate, well, here's what we will do and here's what we won't do. Pastor, you've been talking a little bit too much about sin lately. That's pushing people away. Pastor, how about we don't deal with the whole uh, marriage issue because that's, that's isolating certain people. And we've got people here with, with gay kids. We're going to preach the Word of God. Well, then we're never going to be a success. We're never going to grow. Jesus will build his church. That's what he said. And we're going to do it his way. Why? Because it belongs to him. He called us. We didn't call him. And I'll just say this right here. Daryl Winters, at least today, and I hope this is the way I am for the rest of my life. I'm in this for Jesus' glory, not my own. And I mean that. I want Jesus Christ magnified in and through this congregation. And I want that in other congregations too. I really do. I, there are enough people in this town that, that if, if every church building, and I'm talking about true churches, not these you know, gobbledygook, phony ones, but if, if every church that's a true church in this town were filled up this coming Lord's Day, there would be far more people not in the building than, than within it. We've got plenty of room to, to, to hope the best for other congregations. We're not in a competition. So we're not done. Let me ask you, what are some of the evidences that pride is plaguing a congregation? And I'm going to give you one example that Paul has already given us. Personal preferences that are having more um, emphasis than biblical authority. Why were they divided in verses 10 through 17? What did Paul speak of? What were they divided over? Individual people. I'm of Paul. Well, I'm of Apollos. That's an evidence that pride has crept in. Boy, I like it when Dale preaches. I'm tired of Daryl. Me too. Me too. I don't know. I like John and why don't we get Brother Bob back? I mean, and that Ben guy, he preached one time. I mean, why don't we always have to... What I'm saying is, is that little things like that can creep in. Well, I'm loyal to Daryl. Don't, don't be loyal to me. Be loyal to Jesus. That's one evidence that pride has, is, is making itself known. Can you think of any others? I'm sure there are. I'm genuinely, genuinely asking you, what are some other things that might give evidence that pride has taken root in a congregation? Anything? 
Any guesses? Linda? Well, I'd say one thing. When the, what the church does at a specific given time is more important. I mean, oh, we have this specific Sunday coming up, but we're going to emphasize this, and how everybody get behind, everybody help, you know. Then you have your you have your children's ministries that are begging for help. Do they get anything? <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Zero. Zip of nothing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I'm thinking, if the Lord came today, how many how many hurt people would be left in our church mm. come Sunday, <laughs> and who wouldn't be there? How many of our children would be left because we didn't bother to spend time to explain salvation to them, especially the younger ones? Well, when, you, when you're when you when you're overemphasizing, well, this is really important. Well, I don't think it is. Whoa. Uh, okay. So so why why uh, Jan? Why is this? Well, because my grandchild is in that. Oh, okay. Well, why is it not important? You run it. Well, my grandchild's not in it. Oh, and what you begin to see there is I've got a personal preference and a connection to something. So that's why this should get more of the attention, more of the time, more of the finances. No. No. Well, if it doesn't, then I'm leaving. That, yeah, that's that. Yeah, good insight. Thank you. Y'all gonna do hymn Sunday, choruses, or blend of both? Why? Because how you answer will determine whether or not I'm gonna be there. Y'all, you think that that's happened? Not here. What? Yeah, if, if you're going to do those new songs, then you tell me when you're going to do the old ones, and I'll be here those weeks. Those old songs, yeah, you know, they were new at some time. So how, how old does a song have to be for it to still not be new? But that, that's a preference thing. <coughs> yeah. Pride seeps in really quick. Well, who's leading the Bible study? Uh, well, let me know when the next one's coming around. Okay. Boy, well, I, I don't want to cause trouble. Sure you do. <laughs> Second question, and we're going to finish. How can Paul's words in these particular verses correct believers who are currently being eaten up by pride? And it's more simple than you might think. How can what Paul has said in these verses adequately deal with prideful believers? That God does everything, you don't do anything. It's the Holy Spirit that does the dealing. The, the, the point there is that I didn't, what do you mean? Well, then I don't get any credit. That's right. <laughs> Well, God did his part and I had to do mine. Let me tell you how false that statement is. And we're going to see this in chapter 2. Every person is spiritually dead, not comatose, dead. You couldn't respond to God unless he regenerated you. You can't. It's impossible. Well, but once he regenerated me, it's still him. And even the repentance and faith that he gives to you are gifts from him. The boast is in him. Not that, well, I repented and I believe he gave that to you. And for any person who is really understanding the gospel, they're not going to be like, well, I'm going to have a say it. No, they're going to be like, praise be to God that he would show me mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for pardoning me because I'm not good. I'm not worthy and I never will be. Thank you for, for saving me. I've been in church all my life. I had perfect attendance in Sunday school. I, I led a, a disciple group, whatever else, and I wasn't worth saving, and you saved me. Thank you, Lord. That's how all these verses combat the pr sin of pride, is that it brings you back to look in the mirror of Daryl. You're getting a little full of yourself. Look in the mirror, son. Yeah, but I've got a degree from this seminary and one from that seminary. Oh, no. God, I'm a, I'm a ruined sinner that you showed mercy to. Thank you, Lord. Well, I can guarantee you I've given more to this church than most people. Oh, wow, that's, that's, 
Let me get a plaque for you. Um, I don't know what good it's going to do you in heaven if you get there. Well, I've served here longer. And I'm not trying to minimize faithfulness. But friend, if you're truly being faithful, you're not ever going to brag about that stuff. You're going to say, by the mercy and grace of God, I have done what I've done. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15. I am the least of the apostles, but what I am, I am by what? The grace of God. So when we begin to see pride within ourselves, when we begin to see pride within our body, this is a great passage to come to. Look in the mirror. Do you like what you see? I'm talking about self, self-loathing. No, I don't like what I see. Not because of these added wrinkles since I hit my 50s. I don't like what I see because the mirror is the Word of God that is perfect and it is exposing me and I'm not perfect. But it also is revealing something that there is one who is perfect and He has shown me mercy. Thank you for blessing my heart. That's where we need to get to. That's where we need to, to, to live. And it's a battle. So... Anything else? That's all I've got. Yes, ma'am. Well, one thing, when you mentioned that, one thing that I've always said, God uses us. If, if we allow Him to use us, He wants us to be usable. He does the work. Yeah. You know, we say, as my feet, but He does it all. I mean, if we, you know, if we do what He wants us to do, He sets, he sets things for us to do. Yeah. But he does it, and then he gives us credit for it. <laughs> the late Wayne Barber said it like this. I remember this illustration. He was talking about the Christ life, Christ in you, and he said, look at my, and he took his sport coat off. He said, now look at this sport coat. That's me. Sport coat, move your right arm, and it just lays there. Sport coat, move your left arm. Doesn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Takes the coat, and he puts it back on. He goes, now this is Christ indwelling. He goes, right arm, move. <laughs> <laughs> Left arm move. Because that's Christ in you. Doing the work. Bringing you into it. Yeah. That's the good stuff, folks. It really is. Praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ for saving, sanctifying, and working on us. As Paul says in Philippians 1 6, I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. He will accomplish his work. Hallelujah. Stephen, if you would hit that. Thank you.